Okay, are you ready? Bovril. Correct. Lynx body spray. Correct. Domestos. Correct. Right, last one. But if you get this wrong, it's game over. Pringles. No! That's a Kellogg's brand. What's wrong with you? And he's gone. Sorry about that. I've been playing Spot the Unilever Brands with one of the island's parrots. Um, they're very colourful, but I don't know why people say they're so clever. Anyway, Unilever is one of Mark's core stocks, and that's going to be the topic of discussion today in this episode 14 of The Desert Island Investor. This episode of the podcast is generously hosted by Progressive Equity Research. Visit their website at progressive-research.com. Okay, Mark, in the previous episode, we discussed Focusrite, which is one of your smaller holdings. But this time we're talking about Unilever, ticker symbol ULVR. Now, this is not only a much larger business, but it's also at the business end of your portfolio. So you consider this to be a, a core holding? Yes, it is a, a larger holding for me. Uh, it's the biggest business that we've covered so far uh, with a market cap of 97.3 billion. Uh, it's got a yield of 3.8% and a P of 17.3, and that's based on the current share price of £38.90. And it's currently the fourth largest direct holding I've got, but I will expand on that a little later. Uh, and just to say that it's, it's, I think it's actually fourth in the, in the FTSE 100 behind Shell, AstraZeneca and HSBC. So you've got an oil company, a pharmaceutical company, a bank, and then Unilever. Okay. And when was uh, Unilever first floated? Well, Unilever, as we know them, were formed in 1929 when Margarine Union, a, a Dutch company, and British salt maker Lever Brothers merged. So the synergy being that the substantial dealings that both companies had in animal and vegetable oils. So they started their journey with soap. Yes, with soap, we probably had the first widely available consumer non-durable. Uh, that's a product that when it's used up, it needs replacing. And at a time when the average man and woman were not what we consider today consumers, through, you know, through the resources that they had available, most households could at least afford a bar of soap. And uh, Lever, Lever Brothers were formed in 1885 and became a, became a PLC in 1890. So it had quite a history itself, you know, some 45 years before the amalgamation. And you know, when we think about it, it was a bit of a pioneering product because prior to that, as I understand, uh, salt was was sold in uh, large blocks, horse blocks that had to be carved off. So this was a, a new product. And I believe that, uh, like all great companies, there's a connection uh, with Bolton, where I live. Yes, we've had uh, several references to Bolton in previous episodes. And here again, uh, Lever Brothers, William and James were born in Bolton, Paul. And when did you buy Unilever stock first? Uh, in first in January two thousand and thirteen at twenty five pounds fifty five, and again in July two thousand and thirteen at twenty six pounds sixty nine. You did mention it, but what's the current price today? Uh, Thirty eight pounds ninety. So let's let's take that first purchase. That rep represents a price increase of of fifty percent over ten years. That's five percent per year. You know, you throw in an average yield. I would guess about three and a half percent, and that comes to eight and a half percent, which I think that's adequate for the level of risk I'm I'm prepared to take and, and the defensive qualities that st this stock represents. I don't think I'd invested previously, as I'd fallen in the trap of always thinking that you know the price looked a, a bit pricey. But my style has modified as I've gone along. Unilever recently announced their quarter three results, which we will discuss shortly. Uh, but in previous episodes, you always discussed half-year and full-year results. 
I think this is the first time we've covered a quarterly basis. Yeah, it's good to see that you're paying attention, Paul. Uh, we have spoken about Smurfit. Uh, they report quarterly, but that was not, a, 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 I think there was a, perhaps at the half year, the full year. This is the first time we've talked about a company that's reported uh, uh, one of their quarters. There are a minority, but there are a number of stocks that do report on a quarterly basis, and, and some pay quarterly dividends, uh, like Unilever do. Uh, there's the banks. Shell and BP from the oil sector, tobacco companies like B and BAT and Imperial Brands, Glaxo, and some smaller companies like Games Workshop. Now, quarterly reporting can be a bit of a, a two-headed sword. For investors, it allows more regular, detailed updates. Uh, for those that like them, you know, uh, and those that like them, the, 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 div the dividends are less lumpy. But a criticism is that it creates short-termism, and that makes management less bold as they, are, they think they're going to be judged again in another 13 weeks. Now, Unilever have about 400 brands, Paul, and some of these, I think, are country-specific. But let's think about the power of some of these. Well, let's break this down a bit, because there are indeed a lot of them. Uh, let's start with soap, which was once their core product. So if I'm heading off for a bath or a shower, which brands are owned by Unilever? Well, understandably, uh, they're represented in this sector with brand names like Kame, Dove, Lifebuoy, Purs, Ponds, and Simple. Then there's Radox, which uh, shower gel and bubble bath. Tresemme, which produce hair care products. No jokes there, please, Paul. Uh, Vas <laughs> yeah, Vaseline is a Unilever brand. And then if you want to smell nice, there's always Lynx body spray or Sure deodorant. And uh, to freshen up your breath, there's signal toothpaste and pepsodent and then that tie mark around the bath can be combated with sif and domestos and closer re related in the detergent sector there's brands like omo surf Persil, and comfort some of the most well-known unilever brands are actually foods yeah there's uh hellman's there's uh, i hope i'm pronouncing this right my the dijon mustard uh horlicks bovril nor Pot noodle, uh, how could you, Paul? I don't know if that is actually how that's classified as food sometimes, but it's uh, up to your personal taste. And for dessert, you could have Ben and Jerry's, Cart Door, Cornetto, Magnum, Vianetta, and Walls. My personal favorite Unilever brand, brand is Coleman's. And a sign of how, how the, however I'm committed or sad, you may think I am. I once visited the Coleman's shop and museum in Norwich. But it is since closed, so don't make a special journey. So I would suggest that most listeners would know the vast majority of these brands we just mentioned. And as a marketing man, just think what you could do of, with these brands, Paul. How valuable is brand recognition and how powerful is it in building brand loyalty? Lots of people use the same soap or toothpaste without thinking. You know, they just blindly throw it into a trolley. Well, marketing will identify the buying triggers and, and press the right buttons to reel consumers in. But beyond that initial sale, brand recognition is key to building loyalty alone, really. Um, but with regard to your comment about not thinking about buying things, although distinctive packaging and advertising will take the credit for keeping customers on the hook, to be honest with you, life's just too short to consider several alternatives when you're buying washing powder. Uh, most shoppers will only read the features and benefits once, and they, they could spend a lifetime buying the same thing as long as they spot it on the shelf. Okay, well, one brand I've, I've purposely held back is Marmite. Now, this is a word that's gone beyond the brand, and it's part of the, the vocabulary. We talk about a Marmite person, meaning something or somebody that we either love or hate. And this is the, the case with this product that's a yeast extract. Now, I've got an admission to make, Paul. Uh, on Marmite that I've never tried it. So again, Paul, uh, this brings considerable power, a little like the Hoover being the replacement for the vacuum cleaner. Any particular thoughts on this or just whether Marmite, Marmite is a good tasting product? Marmite is certainly the number one brand for yeast extract spread in the UK. Although to be fair, they don't really have a lot of competition. You, you can buy the Australian equivalent Vegemite here, uh, and there are some supermarket owned brands. In the land down under, uh, Vegemite has competition from uh, brands like Promite, Mighty Might, Aussie Might, and Oz E Might. So perhaps more of a challenge for Vegemite to stay on top in Australia. Uh, 
You, you've never had you've never had marmite. At no, all. no, I don't. It, it sounds like it's a staple diet in Australia, Paul, doesn't it? It it, it does indeed. Yeah. It was, and the only reason I know about it was it was featured in the lyric of a of the song um, by an Australian uh, pop group. Uh, there was a reference to somebody uh, eating a Vegemite sandwich. Oh. And I, I must have been. I had to go and look it up because I have no idea what it was at the time. Okay, they do, these brands do exist, do they? Oh yeah, yeah yes, okay. they, yes, they do, they do. Well, I did a little bit of market research uh, in my local Tesco. Uh, they have Marmite, Vegemite, and Tesco on brand. And this price per hundred grams, the Marmite was one pound twenty, Vegemite was a pound, uh, but seventy five pence currently with club card. And Tesco on brand was 88.9 pence. And I spoke to a gentleman I know very well, Paul, Paul Finch, who's the manager of my uh, uh, local supermarket. And uh, he said that the, the Vegemite and the Tesco on brand together come where, nowhere near the Marmite sales. Mm. So, I mean, it, it's a very distinctive taste I mean, with, with products like that. So you, you either like it and... If you don't like the com competing uh, options, then you just we, you wouldn't ever buy them. Yeah. Um, some, I mean, some things are like that. Some things uh, have a, such an imperceptible difference that you'd be rather stupid to pay over the odds for a brand, but it still works, and people still do they mm. still do pay over the odds for for brand names, even when in a blind test they'd, they'd probably fail to determine which is the one that they've just coughed up a load of money for. Mm. Something I've got to get round to, but I must try it at some stage. Now, when we go to the local supermarket and we see the aisles packed and shelves groaning under the weight of different products, it would be easy to think that they all come from different suppliers. Now, Unilever are a powerhouse, but they're not alone. They're one of a number of similar type businesses who themselves have a broad array of strong brands. Coca-Cola, Danone, Johnson & Johnson, Kellogg's, Kraft Heinz, Mars, Mondelez, Nestle, Procter & Gamble, PepsiCo, Reckitt Bankaiser. I'm, I'm sure I've left somebody out, but you get the picture. Collectively, these companies are responsible for a high percentage of supermarket products. Any thoughts, Paul, on, on how you'd struggle to launch a startup of your own brand of skin cream up against this lot and how you command a place on the super, supermarket shelf? Well, if Marmite did skin cream, there could be a unique selling point to exploit. But, uh, of course, you're quite right. Challenges have a very hard time breaking into markets where there's a well-established brand leader. Yes, especially if you're a single product. Now, some new brands do come along, but they're often taken out by large competitors as a bolt-on acquisition and to bring them becoming a nuisance. Um, I used to think I was a, a free-thinking individual when I went shopping, but because I'm interested in several retail businesses, I do keep up to date with observation on some specialists in behavioral science simply because it can reveal trends that can be good or bad for my investments and i personally follow people like uh, fraser mckevitt at cantor brian roberts at igd philip adcock at adcock solutions and carolyn harlow at uh, soda like creative and i've now come to believe that in the if you take an aerial view of me with my trolley i'm being directed around the store like a lab rat looking for a cheese reward <laughs> the, 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 these big brand companies are vying for prominent display in the store and they take it very seriously. I was once in B&Q with my wife and uh, she met a colleague of hers and they started talking nursing and I entered into a, a conversation with her husband Ivan who was semi-retired uh, but he had a part-time job calling into the supermarkets checking that all the brands were positioned by the stores uh, in the agreed position for the respective deal. Ah, the, the secret shopper, I believe they're called, feared by retail managers everywhere. Yeah, this is becoming something of an eye-opener for, for me. All these big brand companies are, are vying and elbowing one another for prime location. Now, supermarkets are often portrayed as bully boys with suppliers, but the likes of Unilever, with their size and breadth of high-profile brands, are a negotiating counterweight. They need one another, and they're symbiotic. Now, I know that as a Tesco shareholder, you shop at Tesco, does your Unilever holding make you seek out their brands when you're filling your trolley? Absolutely. I could go one step further and say Unilever products containing palm oil, given my holding in MP Evans bowl. <laughs> uh, and you did tell me that you hadn't added to this stock in 10 years. Would you care to share the reason for that with us? Yeah, I have a significant holding in Funsmith, which is actually larger than my own portfolio, which I, I manage or mismanage. And they themselves hold Unilever. So I see this as having further exposure to this stock. By looking at the latest Fundsmith fact sheet, 
the fund has 5.1% in UK listed companies. And my understanding is that is restricted to just Diageo and Unilever. So purely some assumption guesswork on my part, I presume that Unilever is perhaps a couple of percent. So that together will bring my Unilever holding quite, comf com quite comfortably into my, to be in my second largest holding. I understand that Terry Smith has actually been critical of Unilever recently. Yes, Paul, Fundsmith have held Unilever since inception, but has recently voiced con you know, concern. At what I'll, I'll put into my words as they're flip-flopping from one sense of direction to another. It's social message that it's been trying to attach to products and the wisdom of some of their acquisitions over a number of years and the abortive takeover of you know, Glaxo's consumer healthcare division for 50 billion, which uh, was eventually spun out as Alien. So Terry lacks the brands, it's the management he's had issues with. Management can have a good or a bad influence on a stock's performance. So let's talk a little about the people. I believe they have, in recent times, appointed a non-executive director who you described as a bit of an activist. Indeed. Uh, Nelson Peltz, who's 81, he's got an impressive CV. And amongst his appointments, he served on the board of Heinz, uh, Procter & Gamble and Mondelez. Again, some of these familiar names, Paul. That, together with his 1.5% holding, I would suggest makes him worthy of a seat at the table. So, like Terry Smith, he thinks, um, as they often used to say on my school report, that uh, Unilever must do better. And uh, he thinks there's value to unlock. And I think we can now, with that, we'll probably segue into the, the quarter three figures a little bit uh, and the company message from the, from the company. Okay, with respect to the figures then, today we're focusing just on this last reported quarter, which is a, a brief period. Yes, but I think it, it reflects the situation that has been around for some time. Uh, and also, I, I won't bombard you with, with statistics, otherwise, otherwise we'll just talk, turn into a, a talking accounts. But in short, growth was 5.2%. But again, this came from a 5.8% increase in price and a 0.6% decline in volume. So they're selling fewer products at higher prices, and this isn't a great strategy over a long period. And what's the story across the various sectors? The business is split across five sectors, beauty and well-being, personal care, home care, nutrition, and ice cream. Now, the first three recorded volume growth, but it's the nutrition and ice cream that's been the drag with declines of 3.8% and 10.1% respectively. Now, ice cream was affected by consumers trading down, and poor weather in Europe. Ice cream's consumption is still driven by climate, unlike products like soap and toothpaste. And geographically? Well, developed markets showed a volume sales decline of 5.2%, but in comparison, emerging markets grew by 2.6%. And I think this reflects the steady and predictable consumer class from these regions. The economies are developing, there's a shift from working on the land towards per perhaps working in a factory and they've got money in their pocket with which they can afford products that afford them an element of convenience. And if we compare North America with Latin America, there was a 0.2% decline versus a 6.2% increase. So Unilever claimed to sell products to 3.4 billion people each day, but with circa 8 billion people on the planet, there's still significant potential upside as industrialization and urbanization continues. Have you any thoughts on why those volumes of those products are down? Well, I would think in all likelihood it will be trading down, but there could be an element of, of consuming less. But lots of these products have, have defensive qualities. No matter how we feel of our personal circumstances, we will still squeeze the same amount of toothpaste on that brush every morning. Uh, we've talked about own brand in the past when we discussed test scores, and, but this can be hit and miss. Uh, and with an established and familiar brand, we know what we're getting, but a number are switching, and I'm sure companies are improving at reverse engineering. Okay, on the subject of uh, management, Unilever now have a new CEO, Hein Schumacher, who was CEO of a Dutch dairy business. Is that Friesland or... Fr I don't know how to pronounce it. That's how Friesland. I pronounce it, Friesland Campina. Friesland Campina. Uh, before that, he was with Heinz out in China, uh, but he actually started his career with Unilever. Now, I'm intrigued personally that he, he worked for Heinz and he's called Hein without the Z. But more seriously, what does he bring to the table for Unilever and its shareholders? 
Well, I think it's encouraging that he's clearly listened to and taken note of the likes of Terry Smith, Nelson Peltz and others. And it's time, I would call, to get back to basics. Concentrate on selling more product and retreat from a, work, a woke agenda, virtue signalling and products being burdened with a social message. Now, Hein Schumacher has accepted that Unilever has been underperforming for some time and it's not reaching its full potential. Unilever's brands have, have carried them for some time and it's and it's really done okay in spite of itself. Now, my, from my point of view, Paul, this is a welcome message. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that we're both what you call anti-woke. Yes, very much so. I, I, I do think that brand loyalty can be pretty robust once habitual purchasing has, has really set in, but it, it can be dangerous to align your product with an agenda that your customers simply do not agree with. I think the marketing people at Bud Light made that mistake quite recently and managed to kill, I think it was about 13.5% of that brand's revenue in one quarter. So it's something that I think uh, investors should pay attention to when they're doing their analysis. At the end of the day, uh, virtue signaling that actually loses a company money affects the growth value of the stock that you're investing in, and it also affects the income that you receive from dividends. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I don't know if it actually comes under what, but in, in that recent visit to the, the Tesco supermarket that I mentioned, uh, we, we needed some bleach. So I went down that boring aisle that we, we only go down when we, when we have to. Uh, and there are two products there that I found. There was, um, and they were both 750 milliliters. There was Tesco on brand at 70 pence. And then there was Domestos at £1.39. So that's almost double, Paul, for, I don't know, I, I I think that bleach is bleach, pretty much. I might be, I might be wrong, but uh, uh, I think you're right. Yeah, I, I, I can't tell much. It's, it strikes me as a, a, a basic product. But what did catch my eye on the label was that um, of that one pound thirty-nine, five pence goes to help provide safe toilets for UNICEF. So um, not not only is it uncompetitive against Tesco's own brand, they're adding five pence to that is is, is going to a charity, and you, you may say, well. Is that is that Unilever's role to be some kind of social worker? Um, we're in a we're in a period of price inflation, and consumers are having to pay what's, what's five pence on one pound thirty nine, three and a half percent. But as well, it's it, it's it's five pence off your profitability. Um, you know, it's not the price of the one pound thirty nine. It's five pence off your profit, and that's going to be a, a lot less. So. Uh, I don't like to, to to be harsh, Paul, but I'm not exactly sure if you know Unilever should be doing that, or should they just stick to selling product? Well, um, I think probably sticking to selling product. Yeah, and for a lot of people, you know, charity is beyond reproach, Paul, but but not me. It, you know, if I'll raise this up at annual general meetings and, and ask questions, you know, just for some scrutiny. And uh, mm. on this, I did a little bit of, of research on this this UNICEF work, and um, there's a video on YouTube uh, by UNICEF. I think it's about uh, 90 seconds, something like that. And uh, it, it's on about the, the partnership that they do with Unilever and uh, on the UNICEF website, uh, it says that UNICEF has worked with Unilever since 2012, partnered with brands including Domestos, Dove and Lifebuoy to help improve the quality of life and create sustainable change for children worldwide. Uh, since 2012, Unilever has committed over $30 million to support UNICEF's WASH education and gender programs. The generous donation alongside the provision of Unilever's in-kind support and expertise enables UNICEF and Unilever to drive transformational change for communities and children across different social areas. It goes on. But in the video, it shows a school that previously, it's based in India, and uh, it previously didn't have a toilet, and um, <laughs> Unilever and UNICEF have funded this. So again, it's, it's it, I'm really in certain ways, but I'm thinking, is this really Unilever's responsibility? I mean, doesn't India have a space program? Uh, don't, I mean, if they have. They, <laughs> they haven't. Didn't they recently launch a, a kind of probe to the moon? Yes. And they can't put a toilet into a school. That's well, a yes, Paul. Yes, you're, you're way ahead of me on this one. Um, the Chandrayaan three, uh, it was called, and uh, earlier on in this year, in August, uh, there's a lot of fanfare and great national pride when. Uh, that was that was launched to, to the moon at a cost of it was an estimated cost of seventy five million dollars, um, and that was by the that's from the ISRO, which is the Indian Space Research Organization, 
Uh, that was their uh, estimate of the cost in 2020, and it's, yeah, it was thought to have gone up since then. So I would say, is this really identifying needs, Paul? It, it really, you know, if you've got a, 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 a government that's not putting toilets into schools, but you're sending rockets up to up, up to the moon, is Unilever in somewhat not, in, not kind of enabling this practice? Uh, it seems very woke. Yeah, I mean, I can see the obviously the marketing department can instantly see the association. You know, bleach toilets. Maybe they're just trying to establish a, a different customer base. You know, for their bleach. Yeah. But um, yeah, that, that that doesn't. Well, again, from an investor's point of view, you, you've got to. You know, this, you, this is you're talking hard nosed about money at the end of the day, uh, and I think the companies that are offering shares have to appreciate that. All these people, you know, buying their stock have, have got a, a vested interest in the company being as, as efficient and, and productive as it can be. Mm. Um, but unfortunately, I, I think you're up against it with a company of that size, an organisation of that size. Really, mm. I mean, they're they're not going to. I can't imagine they're going to um, respond to any com people complaining about it. You can try. Have you written to them? Uh, no, no, not yet. I mean, um, I'll wait for an annual general meeting. I know it's often said about the UK that we are the, the sixth largest economy uh, in the world, but um, I was just wondering if you knew which was the, f the fifth biggest economy in the world, Paul. <laughs> no, do enlighten me. It's, it's India. It, it, yeah, it, it's India. Uh, and that's courtesy that uh, is from the World Bank. So obviously it's a, a, across a, a much larger population, but I just thought it was interesting to, to, to throw that in. That's because we, we keep saying about, what a big economy we have, and, and we should do more. But uh, you know, I do, I do think some businesses they they, they do lo lose focus about what they're supposed to, what the raison d'être is, and that's to make profit for their owners, and beyond that, employment and their wider responsibilities for their workforce, and not to act as some kind of social worker with you know executives often indulging themselves in personal causes that that are that are close to their heart. It's got to be in balance. Uh, now, you know, these things are tolerable to an extent when all's going well, but when the heat is on, uh, you, 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 you find that these, sometimes these things have got to be, to be ditched because they're suffocating the life out of a business. And I, I sometimes view some of these management teams resembling the, the if you remember the, the, the comedy or mockumentary 2012 with job titles like Head of Deliverance and Sustainability and, head of brand and, and infrastructure and they all sat around a table forever talking and, and, and just achieving nothing <laughs> that was good i enjoyed that program going forwards um i understand that the immediate focus of unilever will be on a core number what exactly does that mean well they've identified 30 power brands and they'll, they'll, those will be some of those that we've, that we've already mentioned and they account for 70 percent of turnover and that's where they think that they'll have the, the quick wins. Right. So you've held this stock patiently for 10 years. And by now, our listeners will be familiar with your interfere with the portfolio as little as possible policy. Uh, presumably, you're happy to sit tight with Unilever? Yes. Well, as I see it, somebody will unlock the full untapped potential of these brands. Unilever have a new CEO and CFO from the from the 1st of January 2024, and that's Fernando Fernandez. Uh, that's an internal appointment. And they have also announced a number of top managerial changes. Now, Heinz Schumacher has laid down some bold ambitions and he's talked the talk, but now it's time to walk the walk. Uh, but I, as I see it, I've got a fallback position with Unilever. The potential of these brands has to at some stage out and they're too strong to disappear. So either Unilever themselves will find a way of doing this under their own steam or if the performance flounders then i foresee a predator in the shape of one of those major titanic competitors coming along and making a bid uh, i hope it's the former uh, as if unilever were to disappear i'd then have to have, find another home for this capital and that all entails more research and, and starting from scratch uh, now kraft heinz made a low ball offer of 115 billion in 2017 and that was quickly killed off almost at birth that was that started on the friday and was abandoned by the following monday but i'm sure 
it's a target and on the consciousness of, of certain CEOs despite its large size. Okay, thank you for that, Mark. And now it's time for our regular spot question in a bottle. So let's see what's inside the bottle today. And it's a question from Declan Hughes. And Declan asks, Mark, why do you invest in AIM rather than the FTSE? Right. Well, thank you for your question, Declan. And it's actually a timely question. Um, I have a number of AIM holdings, but until recently, I've never categorized them separately between those on AIM and the main LSE listings. So I recently totted up my AIM holdings, and I must say I was surprised what exposure I have, as this comes in at 40.4%. Now, that's just the portfolio that I manage, or mismanage, and not the significant holding in Fundsmith, which we've previously mentioned, which would dilute this down to just 16.2%. Uh, AIM stocks provide certain advantages, and perhaps the principal one being that most, but not all AIM stocks qualify for inheritance tax exemption if held for two years. I believe exclusions are generally around companies that deal in investments, land and buildings. And probably the rationale is that they want people creating wealth and not purely parking it. Again, my understanding is that HMRC does not provide a definitive list of qualifying companies. Instead, it assesses the company retrospectively during probate. So it's something that you can only really be sure of once you're dead. Now, another advantage is that you don't pay stamp duty on AIM, which you do on LSE at 0.5%. Now, this doesn't sound a lot, but it is another drag on performance and should not be ignored, especially by portfolio churners. Uh, every time you buy, you pay 0.5% stamp. You don't on AIM, and you don't pay stamp if you just continue to hold. Uh, then there is also less regulation, which results in lower running costs for the, for the business, but perhaps less scrutiny. So you have to take a choice. My aim percentage has steadily been increasing over time, and this has probably been as I've been looking for growth, and aim are generally smaller businesses that offer more growth potential. Uh, there's also a lot of rubbish on aim. Uh, some companies, not only are they unprofitable, uh, they don't even have any revenue. They seem little more than an idea, and they just rack up losses. During 2023 so far, I've made eight purchases and these have all been AIM listed. My decision to invest in AIM up until this point has purely been on the merits of the business alone. But gradually, my thoughts have drifted towards what I potentially leave to my children and how can I maximise this? And I must say, I must stress that is only after I've derived the maximum pleasure for myself. And actually would predict a high likelihood that my wife survives me and she will do inherit my estate in its entirety. But after that event, it concentrates the mind as the after the, uh, the allowances, inheritance tax is some 40%. Yes, ouch. So we may think we've got ample time ahead of us, both husband and wife in their 50s, good health, physically fit, eight mile run this morning but we don't know what's around the corner and we could perish in a single event. People often worry about their inheritance tax and uh, I, I take a different view. I think it should be the children that worry because they're potentially the ones that aren't gonna get the maximum benefits. So since the last episode, coincidentally, my wife and I have been to our solicitors and we've updated the wills that we last made 30 years ago on the birth of our first child. And we've made certain modifications and uh, put uh, mechanisms in place to ensure that you know, the wealth is passed on in an as efficient means as possible. And on this, on this point, I'm sure you'll understand if I don't go into finer detail, as this involves circumstances of people beyond myself. I could always give it away, but uh, like I've said, there's a lot I'd like to do first. 
Now, I've always been forward thinking. I started investing at 18. I made my first will at 27. And now I'm thinking of inheritance tax. Uh, you may, what you might think is an early stage, but that has always worked for me. So I think the inheritance tax benefits of AIM will now become more of a consideration in my planning. Now, what could go wrong? Um, no tax is liked, but inheritance tax is particularly despised as the money has already been taxed multiple times. And there's lots of countries that don't have inheritance tax. Uh, Mauritius, for example, uh, the Isle of Man that I went to uh, earlier this year, I know it's not a country, uh, but uh, also the likes of Pakistan. So it's no wonder that people retain their non-DOM status. So there's been much speculation about scrapping inheritance tax or just lifting the allowances or reducing the rate of taxation. So you would think that this would reduce the appeal of AIM and potentially weaken the share price. And that is despite a number of these very profitable businesses on, on single PEs uh, 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 and, and having net cash. You know, would these valuations collapse? We don't know. Also, would an incoming government abolish uh, inheritance tax benefits of AIM once again in another way, eliminating the differential between AIM and LSE? So there are unknowns on the horizon, and it's a case of do I stick or do I twist? But on balance, I think at 16% of my overall portfolio, I still have head, headroom to add to AIM should I so wish. So with that, Paul, uh, I'm going to clamber aboard the raft and ask you to give me a push off. I'm using my sextant to navigate to Mauritius, where I'll winter for a couple of months. Now, there's a lot for you to keep on top of while I'm away, but all being well, with the wonders of modern science, we will be bringing you the next couple of episodes from different islands. Well, that's all for this episode. We hope that you enjoyed it. Please remember the content is for information only and it is not financial advice. If you would like to pop a question into a bottle for Mark, just post your question in the comments and hopefully it'll reach the island in time for the next episode. Thanks again for listening. See you next time.